everyone, and welcome to today's Textile Talk. My name is Lucy Shaken. I'm SACWA's Communications Coordinator and your Textile Talks organizer. Textile Talks are presented by the International Quilt Museum, Quilt Alliance, Studio Art Quilt Associates, or SACWA, and the Service Design Association. We love bringing you these free programs every week, thanks to the support of our sponsors and contributions from viewers like you. If you enjoy Textile Talks, please consider making a donation at sakwa.com slash TT support. A few Zoom notes before we begin. This is a webinar, so we can't see or hear you, but we can read your comments in the chat. We have enabled Zoom's closed captions feature. If you prefer not to view captions, you should be able to turn them off by finding the CC or live captions button or by going into your settings. If you have questions during today's program, please type them into the Q&A function. And if you have suggestions for ways we can improve or for topics you'd like to see in future textile talks, please let us know in the post-event survey. I'd like to take a moment to tell you a little bit about what's going on in SACWA right now. SACWA is an international membership organization with about 4,300 members. One of the benefits we provide is SACWA Seminar an online educational program that is free for all SACWA members. Each year we cover a different topic. This year we are presenting Tool Talk, all about the different tools we use to make our art. Registration just opened and the program will begin on January 29th. If you're not a member yet, you can use discount code SEMINAR, that's S-E-M-I-N-A-R, all uppercase, for $20 off the first year of a new membership. You can visit sakwa.com slash join to join us today. And if you are already a member, sign up for Sakwa Seminar at sakwa.com slash seminar. So now I'm very pleased to welcome today's guests, Alicia Thomas, the Executive Director of the Virginia Quilt Museum and artist Cindy Grisdella. They'll be sharing about Cindy's current solo exhibition at the Virginia Quilt Museum, Abstractions in Color. Alicia and Cindy, thank you so much for being here today. I'm really looking forward to learning more about the show. Um, so Alicia, go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much, Lucy. And thank you to Sakwa and everyone else with Textile Talks for having us here today. So I'm going to share my screen. And we're just going to jump right in. Before we get to Cindy's exhibit, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Virginia Quilt Museum. For those of you who aren't familiar with us, we're in Harrisonburg, Virginia, uh, so the Shenandoah Valley, the western side of the state. We are open Tuesday through Saturday from 10 to 4. We have two floors of rotating gallery spaces. We generally have three to four exhibitions on display at any given time, and we strive to have a wide variety on display at any time. So everything from historic quilts to modern contemporary quilts and fiber art. So right now, Cindy's show is one of four that's on display. Um, and if you happen to be going to QuiltCon in Raleigh in February and you're driving down from anywhere in New England or the Mid-Atlantic, you should stop and see us on your way. Um, you can see Cindy's show and then head on down to Raleigh from there. Uh, the best way to keep informed is what we're doing is follow us on our Instagram or Facebook. Um, you can see on the screen our um, handles there. It's Virginia Quilt Museum on Facebook and at VA Quilt Museum on Instagram. Um, if you are interested in our collections, our permanent collection is available online through our website at vaquiltmuseum.org. If you go under collections, you can take a look and see all of our permanent collection objects that we own at the museum there. That's 290 quilts. You can see pictures of all of them and read a little bit about them. So that's a very fun thing that we're very proud of. We do also do some programs and events. We have a great Meet the Artist Day coming up on March 16th, which Cindy will be at, along with Wen Redmond, and um, also a local group of weavers who have a show here at the museum. So we'll put a link to that in the chat where you can see some more information and register for that if you're interested. And 
that is just a little bit about the Virginia Quilt Museum. And please just follow us on social media. We do lots of fun things and we would love to have you following along with what we do. And now I'm going to let Cindy introduce herself. So Cindy. Thank you so much, Alicia. And thank you to um, Lucy and Martha and Sakwa for um, this wonderful opportunity. I'm Cindy Grisdella. I'm an artist, a teacher, and an author of two books on uh, improvisational quilting. I live now in Reston, Virginia. Um, and I, my specialties, I guess, are um, improvisational design and piecing and a fearless use of color. So I hope that we'll be able to talk about that a little bit. Thank you all so much for joining us. Great, thank you, Cindy. We're gonna start with a video, a little walkthrough of Cindy's show. And then Cindy and I are gonna have a conversation about her exhibit and her quilting journey and all of the fun things she's doing. So. So that was a quick look at Cindy's exhibit here hung at the museum. And now we're just gonna dive into talking about Cindy's quilting journey. And this is one of the pieces featured in the exhibit. And Cindy, why don't you start by just talking a little bit about when you started quilting and how you transitioned from doing 
very traditional quilting to the more improv and modern quilting that you're doing now? Great question, Alicia. And um, I also want to thank you for the opportunity to have this uh, this exhibit at the museum. It's it was a lot of fun to uh, to 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 hang it last week and to and to to see you know how where where everything was going to be. So this quilt um, is a, a quilt that I started um, many many years ago. I am um, I've been quilting for about forty years, um, but. I started out as a garment maker. There weren't any quilters in my family. So my mother taught me to sew, but I made clothing. Um, and I can't sort of fell into quilting by accident. I you know, saw a, an article in a women's magazine when I was in college and it just, you know, the idea of quilts just sort of grabbed me by the throat. I mean, I knew what they were, but I, you know, I'd never really had one or, you know, had a lot of exposure to them. And so I started out, you know, from that magazine, I thought that since I knew how to sew already that, you know, making a queen size quilt for my first project would be no problem. And I won't go into the gory details of what happened then, but um, it was a little bit less, you know, uh, linear than I thought it was going to be. Anyway, this quilt, um, I started probably in 1996. Um, I've always been very um, interested in Amish quilting and quilt makers. I love the sort of graphic, um, nature of Amish designs. This one, um, I was at the time, you know, raising a family and doing lots of things. And I, I was, I started to hand quilt it, um, but put it aside, uh, you know, life got in the way as it tends to do. And um, I didn't pick it up again until during the pandemic, I was going through my studio and looking at, you know, things that I had to work on. And this one really grabbed my attention. And so I don't hand quilt anymore, but um, I decided, you know, it would be fun to finish this. So I left the hand stitching in the center. There's a, 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 a feather circle in the center and then some um, diagonal lines. And I finished it with, um, I finished it with machine stitching. Um, one thing I think is interesting about this is the back that um, we just ran by just quickly is that um, this is a very improvisational back. And I made it in 1996 before I knew anything about improv. Um, so just kind of goes to show you that sometimes the seeds of your future self are, 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 are always there. Yeah, it's so, this quilt is fascinating to me because I think it really, it represents not only your journey in quilting, but so many people who are doing modern and art quilting really start out doing traditional quilting and then end up in a very different place. So it's fun to see this all in one quilt. That's not something we often see. Um, it reminds me, we have a piece here in the museum collection called Celestial Harmony, which looks very modern, but it's really, it's a Dresden plate. It's a very traditional mm. block that was then set in a very modern way. And so this reminds me of that a little bit where you took something very traditional and over time made it a little more modern. This slide here, um, on the left, you can see your hand quilting in the blue square and a little bit in the rest of it. And then on the right, you can see the machine quilting that you did to finish it. So how did, when you got this out during the pandemic, how did you choose what, how to machine quilt it? Did you just pick whatever kind of struck your fancy or were you trying to match that kind of feathered wreath that you had started hand quilting? Oh, that's another great question. I tend to, um, when I'm picking free motion quilting motifs, um, I, I tend to um, pick, uh, I have several that I, I like to do in certain areas. Mm -hmm. And so this one is kind of a spiral with a stipple echo around it. Um, it's one that I use a lot. It's, you know, it, it does echo that, um, that, you know, that's a, a, a circle that I was starting with, but it also, um, the quilt itself, the nine patch is very linear, so, you know, lots of straight lines. And so the, the organic curves of this motif, um, you know, I think play against that, the linearity of the, um, of the, of the rest of the quilt. And then, um, so I chose that motif for the, the body of the nine patch. And then there are others in the, um, in the borders um, that, uh, that, that are, you know, a little bit different. Yeah, that's, 
it's interesting to me to see how quilting designs evolve. I'm a huge fan of quilting, um, whether it's hand quilting or machine quilting. It's one of the things I love. Um, while I run a quilt museum, I don't actually quilt myself, um, but my fiber art of choice is embroidery. So I think that's why I love quilting so much is it's the stitching. Um, the tactile the, nature. Yeah. Of it. <laughs> um, but that that feathered wreath that you hand quilted is such a traditional yeah. quilting pattern. It's everywhere in quilts going back to the early 1800s. And so then the echoing of it with the design on the machine quilting is just fascinating to me. It's This is one of those quilts I can tell I'm going to study it a lot while it's on display here. <laughs> <laughs> and it's yeah, another thing that's, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying, I really like how we did this exhibit and how you and um, Kate Reed, my curator here, hung this show. This quilt is hung so that you can actually see both sides of it. It's kind of in between two rooms. So you can see both the front and the back. So you can see that improv back on it. And your show's only been open for two days. And yesterday it rained buckets here. So we didn't have many visitors, but all the people <laughs> we've had have really enjoyed being able to see both sides of this one. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. I think there's another sort of improv, um, you know, thing happening in this one that's kind of interesting. If you can look at the the, the nine patches in the lower um, lower section on the um, probably go back to the to the the detail on that lower section on the left. Um, there are just two colors, uh, a sort of a of a weird green and a and a light blue, and then a, a purple and a light blue. And I made those nine patches according to the directions using just two colors, but they really bored me. And so you can see that I have um, some in the upper left of the uh, picture on the left and the lower right of the picture on the on the right. I have some nine patches that I made just out of whatever was left over. And those are the ones that I love. Yeah, that I that's one of those things I had not noticed yet. And that's it's one of the things that I'm always really grateful for is that I get to spend so many time, so much time with these quilts that I can notice these things. Um, we do have one question that maybe we should talk about now while we're at this piece. Um, but Jill was asking if you could talk a little bit about your decision to move away from hand quilting to machine quilting and why you did that. Sure. Um, you know, I think a lot of uh, quilters run into this, um, although not everyone. So I loved hand quilting, um, but I, I kept lists of quilts that I wanted to make. And my list kept getting longer and longer and longer. And I realized that I would never have enough time to finish all the quilts that I wanted to make if I, if I hand quilted them all. And so, um, so it took me years to make peace with using the sewing machine um, to create the stitches. And some of, of the audience may remember back in the day in the late 90s, early 2000s, in the quilt shows, there was a lot of um, sort of push and push back about um, using a machine to, you know, to, um, to, to, to make the stitches. Um, and I was worried as many of my students are worried that I would ruin a quilt that I had spent a long time piecing because the piecing process is very important to me by what I considered inadequate machine quilting. So I went to a couple of, um, I took a couple of classes um, and I really just really didn't stick. Um, it was, you know, it was, it was hard for me. And I think that's important for people to realize because I, you know, I do a lot of free motion stitching now, but it took a little while for me to get there. And, um, you know, there's a couple of things, a couple of stories that I tell. One is um, that uh, I was taking a class unrelated to free motion quilting with Ami Sims from Flint, Michigan, who's, she's retired now, but she's an incredibly funny, generous teacher. And um, she talked about machine stitching sort of as an aside at the end of this class. And she said something that really stuck with me. And it was, nobody knows what you meant to do. So if you're stitching along 
and with on your machine and you get a little wobble or your pebbles are more oval than round, just do it again so it looks like you meant it. Um, and that was incredibly freeing to me, you know, that that I don't have to, I didn't have to worry about every single stitch. The thing that's important about free motion stitching is the texture that you create. I can guarantee you there's some bobbles in that in that um, uh, image that you're showing on the right, but you can't see them and I'm not gonna point them out. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't point out your own mistakes. It, there's no, no need to no. do that. <laughs> and but it's a great texture. So, you know, mm -hmm. so, so, so it's best to, to do what my mother used to always say when I was practicing piano as a, as a child, if you make a mistake, just keep going. Nobody will ever know. <laughs> yep. Yeah. It's, it's something I sometimes have to tell my staff and even sometimes my board members is like, we're not always going to achieve perfect. Sometimes we just have right. to good enough. Um, right. Now, perfect is highly overrated yeah. um and I, I really think that you know that 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 it's important to give yourself a little grace um and especially when you're thinking about you know stitches that are a little bit inconsistent in length um i don't worry about those at all now of course if you've got a pucker or a pleat on the front or the back of your quilt you're going to have to stop and fix it but yeah. uh, besides that um i just keep going yeah. One other quick question. Um, Sandra was asking, is this a variegated thread that you used on there? It, looks it like is a variegated thread. Fire. Yeah, it is a variegated thread. I use, you know, I, for a long time, I used variegated thread almost exclusively. I've now I'm shifting back, but um, we'll probably talk about that in one of the, one of the, the newer quilts. Yeah. Well, let's move on to the next one. So this is serendipity that you finished in 2022 and it's 46 by 51 inches and this one is interesting to me because you when you and I were talking as we were installing your show you kind of referred to it as a variation on a log cabin so using that very traditional block in a very new way right and um this is a this is a class that I teach called improv puzzle um, and I, I, I wanted to talk about this one because it is still a block based quilt. So, you know, I am, I'm making blocks and then I'm in various sizes and then I'm putting them together in a puzzle, uh, you know, like a puzzle. I'm a, you know, I, I love puzzles, any kind of puzzles. Um, but something that, that is kind of interesting about this is that the way that I chose to do what I call break the block. So in the upper left corner, for example, um, that block that you see that's got the three little black arms on it, that's a, a, a block, but because it's set um, on with uh, white, uh, it has white background and it's set with, with uh, white next to it, you don't see the block itself. You see you know, this little shape. Um, and I think that's kind of, um, I, I think that's, that's kind of fascinating um, to, to, to do that sort of, of idea of using a block-based format because it's easier to sew it together, of course. But, you know, doing a little bit of sleight of hand so that it doesn't look like you're, you know, you're putting the blocks together as, as, as you are. Yeah, and that's, there was just a question uh, for some close-ups of this, and we have a couple of close-ups on the next slide. And it reminds me, there are just so many quilt patterns and even traditional quilt patterns where if you're not an expert quilter, sometimes you really have to study the quilts to see what the block actually is and how quilts are put together. The one that comes to mind is the New York Beauty block, which is... <laughs> a historic block. Um, but when you look at a finished New York beauty quilt, what you think is the block is not what is actually the block. And right. so it's one of those things that's always fascinating to me of studying quilts is what actually is the block and how was this actually made and put together? And just looking at some of these close-ups, 
trying to figure out where your blocks are. It's going to be fun to study this quilt. Yeah, I, some people, more. some, thank you. Some people look at the, I, I, I call it a variation on the log cabin because I, I construct it like a log cabin, start with the center and then put the, you know, sort of the rounds of, mm -hmm. around the center. But sometimes people say, oh no, Cindy, it's more like a square in a square. Um, so I think you can, you know, you can probably look at it either way and, uh, um, and, you know, and, and, and decide for yourself. It's, it is, you know, I think it is a modern interpretation of a, um, a, a more traditional idea. Yeah. And we, this is one of the few quilts in this exhibit, at least that has this much white in it and kind of empty space can you talk a little bit about why you chose white as opposed to a lot of your other pieces have black in them sure so um this is part of a series and um i made the um the other quilts in the series um, are a little smaller um and they have uh these you know these bright uh blocks either you know improv log cabin or or square in a square um and the there's a section in the middle that I used uh, um, black and white, mostly white as the background. And so there's a secondary shape that's formed. Um, I was asked a couple of years ago to teach one of those classes at a three day retreat. And I thought, well, you know, maybe somebody who's with me for three days would want to uh, make a quilt that's a little bit bigger. And so I thought, okay, well, I'll just take the you know the, the the first quilt which is about 30 inches square or so and I'll just make it bigger um but it had been a couple of years since I made that one and we all change and grow as artists um even sometimes without realizing it and so when I started putting it together to make it bigger um the quilt had other ideas it wanted to be um it wanted to have a lot more um, it, a lot more what I call negative space. Um, it wanted to breathe. And so I said, okay, you know, let's, let's go with that. And uh, I tried um, a lot of times when I do a quilt like this one that has a lot of negative space in it, I try to use um, uh, fabrics that are similar, but not the same. So um, in this case, you know, maybe you would use white or cream or ivory um, and I tried that with this quilt, didn't work. It just deadened it. And so, um, um, you know, part of my process is I have an idea and I, you know, I start making the elements for that idea and then I put them up on my design wall, but I am constantly um, sort of interacting with my, with my project and asking myself, does this work? because I don't have a pattern to follow. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm designing as I go. And, and, you know, sort of listening to that, you know, creative voice that I believe so strongly is there inside of all of us, even if we don't think that we're creative, listening to that creative voice that says, you know, yes, Cindy, you're on the right track, or no, you need to think of something else is really important. Yeah. One of the things I think is also interesting about this quilt is you've quilted it with straight line quilting as opposed to doing any of the patterns or anything. What was your reasoning behind that for this quilt? Um, some of them, I think um, the, the composition would be um, muddied. Uh, mm -hmm. with, you know, with, with a lot of free motion quilting. I've done some of these, um, some of this style uh, quilt with the, um, the, the spiral and stipple combination that I did on the, um, on the nine patch. Um, but this one, I wanted it to feel very modern and be a little more, um, a little more stark. And, and so I decided that the, the straight lines would be better, but you'll notice in the close up on the left, my straight lines, are um, I do them with a walking foot um, on a regular sewing machine, um, but they're not spaced uh, in a regular way. They're spaced very irregularly um, mm -hmm. because I like that that gives a little more texture 
um, to, you know, to, to the piece than if they were, you know, just a half inch apart to me, that's, that's a little bit, you know, that, that, that's a little more interesting to have them with the irregular spacing. Yeah. And just building off that a little bit, we had a question about what machines you're using for your free motion quilting. And if you switch to a larger machine for that, and since you brought it up, let's talk about it now. Sure. So um, for many, many, many years, um, I did all my quilting on a domestic Bernina sewing machine. Um, and I did my piecing and my free motion quilting, even big quilts I quilted on that machine. Um, and But uh, right before the pandemic, I guess, um, I, I was pushing myself, which we'll see um, in some of the other quilts, I was pushing myself to make bigger pieces. And it was just, you know, it was just, I just needed a bigger machine. So I invested in the Bernina Q20, which is a sit down uh, machine with a 20 inch um, throat area. So it makes it a little easier to do um, the larger quilts, but um, I don't know how to use rulers and I'm not very, um, it's hard to do straight lines on that machine. So for these, for these, quilts that have the straight line stitching, I go back to my domestic Bernina and a walking foot. Even if they are big, like this one's not huge, but it's fairly big. Yeah, that, that's a pretty decent size quilt to be working yeah. on a domestic machine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, one last question while we're looking at this quilt, if um, someone wanted to buy one of your books with this quilt in mind, which book of yours would you recommend? Because you've got more than one book out there. So, yes. Yeah, so my second book, Adventures in Improv Quilts, um, talks about this technique, not this quilt specifically, because that one was made. Um, this was made after the book um, was released in 2021, but it talks about this technique. Perfect. Well, we move on to the next quilt. Someone was asking what type of batting you use. I use, um, um, mostly I use uh, Hobbs heirloom, 80% uh, cotton, 20% uh, polyester. I like the, it's a fairly thin batting. Um, I like the cotton, but the polyester in it gives it um, just a little bit of stability so that it doesn't, uh, you know, you, you, it doesn't uh, shift like some cotton battings will do. Thank you. Next up, we have Aquarius, which is a slightly older piece, 2018, which is, golly, somehow already six years old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How did that happen? Uh, I don't know. Um, and this one's 47 by 53. So it's, it's a decent size wall quilt. And this is, when I think of your work, this is the type of piece I think of. It's really what comes to mind. So clearly you've been making these types of quilts for a while. When did you start making things that would kind of look like this? And what drew you to that, Cindy? Um, well, uh, I, you know, I, I, I was making block-based quilts and I, I had released my first book, um, Artful Improv in 2016. Um, but I'm, I come from, uh, I, I have a degree in art history so I come from sort of a, an art background. I took a lot of um, drawing, painting classes um, growing up. I was very fortunate that my parents were supportive of my um, interest in art. And um, I ended up uh, majoring in art history. And so I'm always you know, trying to push myself. And um, in 2017, I started studying with Nancy Crow in, um, at her barn in Baltimore, Ohio. And I went there because I wanted to, um, I wanted to learn how to make work that was more like art um, than, um, than, than quilts. Um, I don't have anything, anything against quilts. I love them. Um, I will always love them, but I wanted to push myself. And so this quilt is one of those that came out of um, my studies with Nancy. This is not one that I did uh, under her under her supervision. Um, and you can see there's no block here. Um, this is all, um, I created it uh, 
on the design wall um, before I sewed anything together. There's some fairly, um, uh, shall we say, interesting um, engineering challenges that went on with this quilt. Um, one thing that I really wanted to, um, I wanted to explore with this was the idea of using color to create a sort of a three-dimensional uh, uh, idea in a two-dimensional space. So the, the, the focal point of this quilt was that pod shape in the center, which I thought about as a, as a abstract fish or possibly a bird. And so I used warm, strong, saturated colors to, um, you know, to, 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 to create that pod. And then I wanted to have the, um, you know, sort of those arcs and curves feel like they were going underneath it. And so I used cool colors, the blues, the purples, and the greens um, to, uh, to, to, to make that happen. And, and I think, you, you know, looking, it's maybe a little bit easier to see it in person, but um, certainly the photo also um, just kind of shows that, that those, those warm colors in the pod come forward and the cooler colors stay back. So it feels like, you know, there's, there's um, more than two dimensions that I'm working with. That's great. We had a question um, about how you choose your color palettes. And if you just want to talk a little bit about how you use color and that, I think it would be great to talk about that now. Sure. So um, I will preface this by saying that when I started quilting 40 years ago, I was terrified of color. So I made a whole lot of blue quilts. Um, uh, I have them and, you know, they live at my house. Um, I show them occasionally uh, when I'm giving a talk on, you know, my journey uh, uh, as a quilter. Um, and so I think that it's important for people to realize that using color and working with color is something that can be learned. Um, I did. Uh, it, 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 it was a, you know, it was, it's been a sort of a, um, a process for me. Um, I, I used lots of blue. I did never do yellow, never orange, never brown. But now I use all the colors. And, uh, and, and so um, I, what I tend to do is to um, start out with a um, first decision I make is uh, what sort of a feeling do I want for the quilt? Do I want a warm uh, active energetic quilt? Do I want a cooler, more, more calm quilt? In this quilt, I opted for a little of both. Um, and then I, I pull my fabrics, eight to 12 fabrics, um, you know, that speak to that, um, that idea. And, um, and then I audition them. Uh, and, and, and because, you know, you'd be surprised how um, colors, can be very similar and be one be exactly right and one be not so much. Um, I started about 20 years ago, I started using um, mostly solid fabrics in my quilts, um, the, the nine patch notwithstanding, um, because I really like the graphic strong nature of uh, the, the, solid, um, the solid colors. Um, not that I don't, you know, love prints as well, but, but for my work now, it's just really important to have to be able to make that color state. That's great. And as we were hanging your exhibit, I was laughing and saying, even the backs of your quilts are so pretty because the backs of your quilts are often your prints. And then you said, yes, because you now almost work exclusively with solids and you had print fabric to use. So, right. I mean, I, I have those prints. I paid for them. I, you know, they, they, they need a home. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so a couple of questions about this quilt, um, Sandra was asking if kind of the spokes are actually a different black than some of the bigger arcs. And I think you can see that a little bit more in these detail photos. Um, yeah, so I call these spines, uh, the, they're, they're sort of a dark gray, um, that, that divide the color, um, the areas of color, and then the, the, the curves, the long curves are black. Um, and I, I did that again, you know, because uh, it's more interesting to use fabrics that are similar, but not the same. Um, it gives, you know, gives, you know, the viewer something different to, to look at. If those, if those, um, 
if those spines had been black, it would have been fine, but I think possibly not as interesting. It's also a really subtle detail. They're not all that different to the point that when I was putting together this PowerPoint and I started looking at these pictures, I was like, are my photos weird? And I had to like go right. look at your photo <laughs> and be like, what? And then I was like, oh no, those are different fabrics. It shows up a little bit more in some of the photographs than it does in, per in person that they're different. Um, uh, kind of technical construction question. How are you um, constructing your curved pieces? Are they seamed? Are they appliqued? That's a great question. So I'm a piecer. All of my work is pieced. I, I know how to applique, but I'm not very good at it. I don't enjoy it as much as I do enjoy piecing. Um, and so those long black curves um, in particular were cut um, freehand out of one piece of fabric and um, um, and 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 the rest of them were were as well. It's a very it's a it's a freehand process. It's using my rotary cutter like a drawing tool. Um, you know, it's a very different from from pattern based quilt making because um, you know I'm 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 deciding every cut, every line, every shape. I'm deciding you know how wide is that going to be? Is it going to be you know wider at one end and narrower at the other? Um, and how, how does that look? Uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a really, for me, just a, a really exciting process. That's great. Um, let's go ahead. We've got, I think, two more quilts to look at. So let's move on to the next one and we'll keep answering questions as we go. So this is balancing. It's one of the smaller pieces in the show. It's 20 by 20 inches that, and you just made it this year. And one of the questions is, are, are your pieces framed on canvas? So this one is on canvas. If you wanna talk about that, not all of them are, but this one and some of your smaller ones are. Right. So some of the smaller ones are, um, are mounted on canvas um, pre, uh, pre-stretched canvas that I paint black on the sides and the um, and and into the into the middle. I do have I think Lucy's putting it in the in the chat. I do have a free tutorial on my blog um, about how I do it. Um, I spent ten years before the pandemic traveling around the country showing and selling my work at fine art and fine craft fairs. Um, I kind of thought of myself as the ambassador of the art quilt because, you know, so many, I was often the only um, uh, fiber artist or, or decorative fiber artist as opposed to someone who sold clothing and things like that. And, um, and I realized that I needed to make uh, some of the pieces more accessible to, uh, you know, you, you can't, you know, you go to a show, you're not going to be able to sell six, you know, 80 by 80 quilts. And so I started um, with this process of mounting some of the smaller work on canvas. It does a couple of things. Um, one, it, um, it, it kind of elevates the piece and makes it clear that it's art. It makes it clear that, you know, there's a wire on the back. You just hang it on the wall like a painting. It also kept people from uh, people, especially people who are not familiar with quilting or not familiar with quilting as an art form from asking me, Cindy, why are you putting a pot holder on the wall if you don't have that canvas? So, um, so it's a really nice uh, way to, you know, to present smaller pieces. Um, and one thing that I will say is that if you are, if you want to exhibit your work, enter it into competitions, which I encourage um, everyone to do. It's a really wonderful thing. Um, many quilt uh, shows will not accept uh, uh, this type of presentation, but many art shows will. And, uh, and you just have to ask, you know, if it's an art show, do they accept fiber or multimedia pieces? Um, and so this, the quilts are, um, I finished the quilts, Stitch them, batting, you know, backing, uh, put the, all the stitches on the front. Then there's a, a fourth layer that um, encloses the edges, and that, and then I, um, I, I adhere the the, um, the the piece to the canvas uh, with a product called gel medium, 
that um, that my multimedia artist painting friends uh, recommended to me because it doesn't harm the it doesn't harm the quilt. It's it's a fascinating process. I after you and I talked um, while we were installing your show, I went and looked at your website to see, and it was it's if you're at all interested, I highly recommend checking out Cindy's website and seeing how she does it. I did also like the point you made about putting quilts on canvas makes them more accessible to people as art and makes people think about them as art. That's one thing um, Susan Lapham and I talked about last summer. Right. She she mounts some of hers on canvas. She does it a very different way than you do. Right. But in talking with her, I said, you know, why did you start doing this? And she said, it's because then people think of it as art and then they buy it as art. Right, um, exactly. And, it's, and there's lots of different ways to do it. Um, Susan does it completely differently, um, you know, wrapping the quilt itself around the canvas. Mm -hmm. um, and if you Google, you know, mounting quilts to canvas, you will find all kinds of different ways to do it. This is the way that works best for me. Um, and so, uh, you know, so, so if you're interested at all, take a look. Yeah. A couple of questions about fabric. Um, what type of fabric you're using? Is it hand dyed or are you using commercials? Do you have a favorite black fabric? <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, I am sort of, uh, I don't know, omnivorous when it comes to fabric. I, I, I use the fabric that has a color that I want. Um, I do use, perhaps surprisingly, a lot of Kona cotton. Um, the reason why is because it comes in so many different colors. I, um, I love hand dyed fabrics, but that is not a skill that I have. Um, and so often I do buy hand dyed fabrics from other people who are much better at it than I am. <laughs> um, and, um, uh, uh, you know, I use, I use, uh, you know, Bella solids, um, you know, I use some oak shot cottons uh, that are, you know, uh, shot cottons that are the warp and the weft are different, uh, different, uh, slightly different colors. Um, those are fun. Um, um, you know, in this one, you can see it a little bit better in the in the negative space behind these uh, these shapes, which um, I, you know, it's a, this is a a a, um, a new series. Uh, the, the the fabrics behind the negative space um, are different colors. You know they're 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 a little brown or gray or black. Um, I don't really have a favorite black, but I think that most of these are Kona black. Um, so these big saucer shapes are something that I'm exploring now. Um, I have um, uh, two. Uh, one of my uh, one of these quilts, a bigger one, is is traveling with the Sakwa minimalism show, which I'm very excited about. And the other one um, was accepted to Quilt National last year. So. Um, so that was very exciting. And, um, you know, again, with this idea that I'm always kind of pushing myself, you know, using these big shapes um, instead of the little tiny piecing that I'm known for and love is a push, is a stretch for me. But stretching is, you know, is, uh, is important. And I also want to just really quickly um, credit uh, Paula Kovarek, um, who has a wonderful book out on free motion stitching. These uh, this motif is called is a is a, a, a riff on her fence posts. Um, so it's not original to me, but it's my interpretation of that. That's great. I do have to tell you that when I was looking at these photos, they reminded me a little bit of Pac-Man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I I was delighted by that. I was like, I'm in my head. This is probably going to be the Pac Man quilt now. Um. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're very fun to stitch, and they and they cover the space um, in in a very interesting way and relatively quickly once you get the hang of it. Yeah, they're fascinating. We've got one more quilt to cover in just about five minutes left in our time. So this one is Beetlejuice and it is a brand new quilt. I think you finished it last week. <laughs> I did. I finished it the day before I drove down the, the quilts down to the museum. It was really touch and go there. <laughs> there's uh, you know, there's nothing like a deadline to get work done sometimes. That's right. That's right. That's um, right. This one, it's one of your bigger pieces. It's 58 by 61 inches. And a question that came in that maybe we can talk about with this quilt is 
do the names of your quilts have any special meanings or do you finish a quilt and then name it or do you start off with a name that helps inspire it maybe uh, that's a great question um a little both uh sometimes um this one uh i don't know it was just the colors that just made me and the and a little bit of the shapes that just made me think of, of the movie beetlejuice and um um i i I like naming my quilts, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to, you know, have it be, you know, improv number 75. Um, and uh, um, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's hard. Sometimes the, the names come to me, uh, come to me um, uh, easily. Um, sometimes I have a piece that I'm working on and I'll put the top out on um, Instagram and, and ask my followers, what do you think this one should be called? Um, and I have a quilt. Um, I have a quilt called Picasso's Chickens. That um, that the name came from that process. So it's fun to you know to to kind of interact uh, as you know um, uh, with 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 the whole process. Yeah, I I'm not great at naming things, so I would just constantly be throwing stuff out to my social media followers. I'd be like, just name all of my quilts. <laughs> yeah, it's a so this one. Yep, yeah, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say it's a fun way to interact on social media as well. It okay. is. But. It is. You know, this one is uh, again one that there is no block here, um, and uh, and and the the lines and the shapes are are really you know I, I'm happy with this one because of the organic nature of those curves. I love curves. I've been you know playing with them for years. You can see from the the, the Aquarius in 2018. Um, but I'm happy with this one because there's uh, the lines are a little more expressive. Um, the curves, especially um, the ones in the in the, the 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 curves right below that sort of rectangular shape in the center, are very you know very sort of um, uh, expressive and and organic, and I'm happy with that. That's great. Um... I love it. I'm so glad you were able to actually finish this one. I know you had some machine trouble. Yeah, I did, so. but it all worked out. <laughs> I had to use three different machines on this quilt. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, you know, the art of making do is. Uh, exactly. Yep. Quilter Mary Kerr would say some, you just do what you got to do. Um, that's right. And that's part of the process, right? Just, mm -hmm. just, just do what you got to do. Yeah, we've had a couple of questions about how you're binding or finishing the edges, whether you're binding or facing or. So all my quilts are faced, um, except for the the uh, the nine patch, and I have um, another um, uh, tutorial on my website for the um, for the facing process. Um, but again, you can Google facing an art quilt and you'll get lots of different ways to do it. I do that because I like, I want my quilts to be presented as art. And the, so I want the, the composition to go all the way to the edge with no distraction. Yeah. And have you always done it or when you were doing more traditional quilts, were you binding those? I, I bind my, my more traditional quilts are bound. Yeah. Um, but, but I've been facing for the last, you know, probably 15, 15, 20 years, maybe. Yeah. One last question, maybe, maybe we'll have a couple more minutes, um, but a couple of people have asked if you draw out your quilt designs first, or do you just work on a design wall? Oh, that's a great question. No, I am, well, I am a very intuitive, organic um, designer. I tend to just cut the shapes and put them up on the, um, on the, on the design wall. Um, and then, you know, as I said, audition and, and you know, sort of speak to it, uh, have it speak to me about um, how, how it's going to go. I don't usually do a drawing. That being said, for Beetlejuice, I did do a little drawing. Um, so whatever works, again, whatever works is the thing to do. Has that, has that process evolved over time for you? Um, yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, it, and some of it is just kind of learning to trust your instincts, which is another thing that I think is really important. You know, I like to say at the end of all my lectures, there really is no quilt police that's going to come and tell you you're doing it wrong. If you are happy with what you have created, then that's the only thing you need to do. Please yourself. That is great. 
I think that is a great note for us to end on today. Um, we are just about out of time. I want to say thank you so much, Alicia and Cindy, for um, sharing your exhibition today. The art was just phenomenal. And it was so much fun to learn about your process and a little bit more about why you make the choices you make in your quilting. Uh, next week's textile talk is Mi Kyung Lee, Threading Memories and Weaving Connections, presented by the Surface Design Association. It'll be at the same time, same place, Wednesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, I was lucky enough to see some of Mi Kyung's work in person at the Philadelphia Museum of Art in 2021 as part of an exhibition called New Grit, Art and Philly Now, and it was just so incredible. So I'm really excited to learn more about her next week. As always, you can find all the details at sakwa.com slash textile talks. And if you enjoy textile talks, we would love it if you would tell a friend, post about us on social media, or consider supporting us financially with a donation at sakwa.com slash TT support. Hope you all have a fantastic Wednesday, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, guys.